And we turn next to Professor Pak Hyung-ji of Yonsei University. Uh, Professor Pak teaches in the Department of English Language and Literature at Yonsei. She did her undergraduate work here at Harvard. She did her PhD at Princeton University. And uh, she has very uh, wide-ranging interests from the Victorian novel to Asian American literature to contemporary Korean popular culture. Um, she served as dean of Yonsei University's Underwood International College from 2012 to 2016. And a few years before that, uh, she was here actually at uh, the Harvard Yanjing Institute as a visiting scholar, I believe. She's written widely on issues in Asian American literature, gender in uh, literature, English uh, literature, and so on. So it's a great pre pleasure to turn next to Professor Pak. It's a great pleasure to be in Cambridge always, but a pleasure to be on this round table because the issues that we're talking about today, Asian studies in Asia, uh, is something that is very much on the radar, both personally for me and um, in, the academic, in the field of academic discourse these days. I'm not a traditional Asianist by any means. My primary field is in uh, English literature, um, but I also work in the fields of Asian American literature, Korean film, um, and English, and uh, I've been thinking about and publishing on just this question of what it means to do scholarship in Asia. It seems to me that one of the most pressing questions that we face as scholars these days is the question of location, of having uh, where, how our scholar, of addressing how our scholarship is shaped by where we are. Um, it seems to me that even as I write on Charles Dickens or Chang Rae Lee or Korean vampire film, which I actually do, um, it should be important that I'm writing from a position of my subjectivity as somebody located in Seoul. Uh, in the brief time that I have today, I'd like to touch on what the new Asian studies might look like, um, how Korean studies has generally been funded, uh, how um, we see this new Asian studies reflected in the field of education, and finally some challenges or food for thought as we look ahead. Um, the new Asian studies. If the old Asian studies was more department-based, nationalist, and limited in its international communicativeness, the new Asian studies is more inclusive, more international, more interdisciplinary, and more collaborative than its predecessors. Uh, indeed, there was no such thing as Asian studies. I think this is a continuing topic of what we're talking about. What does it mean to have uh, Asian studies um, uh, there was no such thing as Asian studies under department-based systems in which scholars rarely spoke to colleagues across the quarter, much less across the ocean. Uh, the new generation of Asian studies scholars engages in a more inclusive concept of Asia. I think this is including Central Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, for instance. Adopt a more comparative view, uh, seeing the different Asian countries in fluid interaction with each other rather than as discrete entities and reach across international audiences to forge collaborations and networks. In particular, if you think about the Korean example, um, Asian studies in Korea has traditionally been about Korea and about China. Uh, Japan has been very vexed in the last half century. And so um, Yonsei University, for example, does not have a Japanese department. Um, but as I will say later, it does have faculty working in Japanese studies in uh, more unconventional departments or affiliations. Um, and largely the rest of, you know, sort of any Asia outside of uh, Korea, China, and Japan has been traditionally ignored. Um, many of the newer departments, programs, and research institutes share a sense of the need for a new mission for Asian studies. And prominent among these is the idea that Korea needs to take part in the creation of new models that offer an antidote or an alternative to Western, uh, the domination of Western theory, um, or to critique the ways in which Western models have defined how we look at or represent Asia. Um, for instance, Seoul National University's Asian Languages and Civilizations Department's website says, uh, uh, quote, being aware 
um, of the predominance of Western research model in humanities, we are bound to contribute to develop our own independent perspectives and methodologies based on Asian tradition. I think this is what is the new sort of exciting um, thing that's going on. It's not necessarily sure where, where we'll end up. Um, but other similar institutes or departments, such as the Yonsei Institute for East-West Studies, or Sungyungwan University Center for East Asian History, or Sagang University Southeast Asian Studies Institute, all have the mission to open up Asian studies and to intervene critically in the international debate about Asia's identity and history. Asianists and other sites have made a similar call, and my fellow panelist, Professor Wang Hui, in um, the Politics of Imaginary Asia or Quan Xin Chen in Asia's Method have called for challenges to Western models and a need for what Chen calls de-imperialization. So I think this is where, what I think we are in Asian studies, that um, we need to find ways to develop uh, Asia-centered models. Not that these haven't existed in the past, they have existed, but then we've, um, the language that we speak, the lingua franca that we speak, this is something that we talked about at lunch today, actually, with the panelists and with Professor Perry, um, about what it means that English is <clears throat> a necessary center for this kind of conversation, and how does language or how does a cultural context change the modes in which we even think? Is it possible to think, uh, to think Asian within English, or what does that mean, um, and how can we, uh, even in approaching Asian studies, if it's been so dominated by uh, Western theoretical models, how can we come up with new models and new ways of thinking that both access um, the historical depth that Asia possesses and allows us to participate in an international conversation. Uh, research collaborations and networks are per perhaps the most important venue for this kind of uh, revamping. And as I said, I'm not a very traditional Asianist, and I thought I'd tell you about it. just a couple of research um, groups that I'm part of that show you what strange new things the new Asian studies can be doing. In the first group, I'm working with um, about, it's funded by my home institution, so there's no external government funding. The, it's uh, six participa participants from Yonsei and a dozen participants from elsewhere, usually uh, pr primarily the US and the UK. We're meeting um, to collaborate on post Hallyu Korean film. And so um, we meet at least twice a year. It's a three year, three year project uh, to have workshops and meetings. Um, and I will be writing about three articles from that. Two have come out, and one I'm still working on. The first two are one is called Gendering the Cave Vampire. So I actually do a cross uh, comparative cultural analysis of how. Uh, the Eastern vampire and the Western vampire are represented differently and have different um, genealogies. We can talk about that later if you want. Um, uh, and uh, the second is on actually a new Korean uh, uh, television series from two years ago called Vampire Prosecutor. I think this is uh, one of the only cases in which a vampire is actually um, an enforcer of the legal code. So I'm asking why that is. Why? Well, actually, my question is actually why the, the, the critique is the series is very much a social critique of contemporary Korean society and its corruption at the highest levels. And I actually ask what kind of um, comment is this on a society if you need to turn to a vampire to be the upholder of law? So what, what is Korea doing these days? Um, uh, and then I'm working on another paper on uh, Park Chan-wook's uh, Thirst, his vampire film, and his next Hollywood film, Stoker, which I think is also a vampire film. But anyway, again, more on that later. Um, another research group that I took part in, or tried to take part in, we actually wrote the grant proposal and didn't get the grant, so you will never see the results of this work. But um, it's an application that I wrote with four other Korean scholars and, and again, half a dozen Anglophone scholars to participate in an ongoing definition of, of global fiction. This is sort of a field within English literature, but global fiction is perhaps the newest incarnation of a term that's you know literature in English, third world literature, et cetera, et cetera. The new word that seems to be gaining currency is global fiction. And uh, what we are trying to do in this research project is to actually talk about um, how we, as scholars of English literature in Korea, could engage in this ongoing definition to include an Asia-based perspective as a sort of global definition of this term in English literature is taking shape. Um, alas, we didn't get the funding, so um, this, this work may never see the light of day. Uh, when we turn to funding, while um, the research that we can be doing in the New Asian Studies uh, 
can depend upon individual scholars to create new models. The funding for such research and for institutional and for the institutional development of Korean studies is still tied to the national nationalist politics of government support. Um, perhaps the biggest funder of Korean studies is, is of course, the government-sponsored Korea Foundation. And I'm sure those of you in the room have received funding in various um, means from uh, the Korean Foundation. It is the primary funding source for Korean studies initiatives internationally. Its biggest contribution is perhaps its establishment of um, Korean studies faculty positions in the US and elsewhere in the last quarter century. One of the earliest partner institutions, of course, is our own Harvard University. Uh, uh, for the first position, a position in literature in 93, a second in history in 1996. The Korea Foundation has, between 1992 and 2015, established 119 positions in 79 universities in 13 countries around the world. These positions are meant to be startup grants that expect the host inst institution to pick up the funding and the support. Um, and in some cases, the continuing support has been, has been bumpy. But the Korean Foundation still remains indisputably the primary driver of Korean studies programs, departments, and, faculties, and faculty internationally. This is. Uh, an, an, um, the, Korea Depart the Korea Foundation also supports Korean language teaching, Korean visiting faculty abroad, graduate postdoctoral and field work, and cultural and, and arts exchanges. The, um, there are a lot of different sources, but I'd also I think the other interesting um, major category of funding these days within Korea is the HK, or Humanities Korea Project. And the reason for this is that HK actually funds research institutes um, uh, in many areas. And some of the institutes that I mentioned earlier, uh, as well as um, uh, the Institute for Japanese Studies at Seoul National University, the Institute for Korean Studies at Yonsei, the Asia Pacific Research Center at Hanyang University, the HK Center for Northeast Asian Studies at Korea University, et cetera, et cetera, are a lot of um, initiatives made possible by HK funding. And as you can see, the kind of, um, this is true, actually this is true the world over, that existing departments and, and um, programs, existing departments and structures of faculty affiliation are very hard and intractable and impossible to move. And so in some ways the research institutes are those that are trying to do some of the new um, initiatives in the Asian studies that has not been addressed by traditional uh, departments and structures. And so a lot of this funding um, has uh, led to this dramatic increase in the number of research um, institutes. Some of these research institutes still maintain nationalist approaches to scholarship, but again, funding is tied to internationalization, to, um, uh, to uh, you know, ra rankings, et cetera, et cetera. And so most, many of these research institutes are also involved not only in having international conferences and workshops, but also starting international peer referee journals. And so there's been a lot of work and movement in research institutes. Um, however, one sort of um, uh, unfortunate, I think, thing is that a lot of the research institutes funded by HK have not been as, uh, sufficiently tied to existing departments as would be beneficial. So that actually the faculty hired by a lot of these research institutes are considered research professors. And when I describe these, this to my colleagues in the US, they say, that's great. You get to be a professor and, excuse me, not teach. Um, but uh, in actual fact, a lot of these um, programs have, a lot of the research institutes um, end up uh, we, we sort of joke and say that they're paper producing machines and that a lot of the HK faculty are sort of, you know, I mean, it's sort of a new kind of, I don't know, well, anyway, so just um, of, of sort of, you know, feeding and, yeah, it's this research production machine. And so uh, compared to the number of research institutes that HK has funded and the number of faculty that have been involved in these programs, we're um, seeing not quite the, uh, the impetus for a complete change in dialogue and conversation that we may wish to see and that we, we may have hoped for. When it comes to the educational front, um, internationalization and interdisciplinarity can be driven by the student market as well as by scholarly trends. 
And sometimes these, uh, the educational programs provide, can provide an impetus for institutional change and shakeup. Um, at Yonsei University, I'll just talk about two different programs. The Graduate School of International Studies, which opened in 1987 with the idea of increasing the university's internationalization. Um, and the, this program, which was funded by, started by government funding that supported in, internationalization, um, actually was, this was the same impetus at the late, in the late 80s it started, uh, virtually similar GSISs at Seoul National, Korea, IHWA, and other um, programs. So we have a number of GSIS type programs in Korea, even though some of them are not um, seeing the student numbers uh, that they would want. Um, it is mostly a social science, it's most made up mostly of social scientists, but has some humanities faculty, offers master's and PhD degrees, and currently at Yonsei's GSIS, the number of entering international students outnumbers um, Korean students. The uh, undergraduate program, under, Underwood International College, where um, a former professor at UIC is actually in the audience right now, my former colleague, um, uh, where I served as dean until recently, was designed as an all-English liberal arts undergraduate college within a Korean research university and took in its first students in 2006. Uh, when we founded UIC, we um, founded it with the idea that there were so many Korean students uh, interested in studying overseas, but a lot of those students were returning to Korea and finding that they were missing that all-important element of success in an Asian society, which is the alumni network of who you know. And so we um, actually adopt, we, we created the, the UIC model to provide a pretty much an American style education within the context of Korea um, so that you could get the education and also the alumni network of Yonsei University. Um, uh, the Graduate School of International Studies was initially supported by government funding. Um, UIC's undergraduate program did not receive any government funding was an, and was an internal Yonsei initiative. Both of these uh, programs engage with the problem in a very pre-professionally driven education market reality in Asia between humanities education and student demand for majors such as economics, business, and engineering. Um, also, since both of these international colleges have a large international student population, Asian studies was a natural addition to the list of majors. UIC launched its Asian studies major in 2012, and GSIS has uh, offered a track in Asian studies. Um, these international programs have also shaken up existing department structures in interesting ways. As I said earlier, um, Yonsei doesn't have a Japanese studies department, but it does have Japanese studies faculty in GSIS and UIC. So these kinds of things change the way we can do work. Um, and because uh, these programs don't offer, don't follow an existing institutional models, they offer greater <clears throat> opportunities for interdisciplinary research and collaboration and teaching. At the same time, these programs are Korea's contribution to what I think of as a global race in international education. For example, colleges like Yale, NUS, National University of Singapore, or NYU Abu Dhabi testify to a changing landscape in international education within which UIC also takes its place. And I know that all sort of major US universities are wondering what to do about these kinds of uh, changes. When it comes to the politics of Asian studies, and this is sort of what I will end on today, what is perhaps thorniest of all is that the history of colonization, Cold War, and division makes it difficult to call for regional unity. When regional politics is still mired in news headlines of skirmishes over island territories or marine jurisdiction or history textbooks or reparation for past injustices, how can we begin to think about a sustainable Asian studies in Asia? The editorial statement of Inter-Asia Cultural Studies calls for, quote, an ongoing construction and reconstruction of critical inter-Asia subjectivities. Is it possible in a region mired in ongoing political and trade issues, as well as historical grievances, to move ahead with some unity? Uh, and while I've spoken earlier about um, Asian challenges to Western constructs, or why it is that we need to create a new model for uh, Asian studies to, 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 to leave um, Western theoretical 
constructs, in some ways a very category of Asian studies. As Professor Perry sort of summarized at the beginning of her, in her opening talks, um, has a specific ideological past. It's a Cold War construct. It's an attempt for the US to understand um, uh, countries that it simply didn't understand. Uh, and so Asian studies um, has its legacy in uh, a Western view of looking at um, the East and uh, of a certain Orientalism. Uh, and yet there's no comparable way to describe Asian studies in Asia. Is it resistance to the West? Is it conflict amongst itself? Is it, wh what is it reaching for? What defines a model or an ideological impetus behind a new Asian studies? And I think this is something that we need to find there are, of course, uh, lots of things that are happening. Um, the Association for Asian Studies holds an AAS, an Asia meeting. What, what, you know, maybe that can come up with some original ideas. Uh, in some ways, I think Asian studies and academia in general has operated as a, a hub and spoke system with the West always at the center. Um, but I think in some ways, when we talk about Asian studies in Asia, the, uh, the time has come for the spokes to be talking amongst themselves. Um, perhaps it would be useful to get to a point when the question will not be about an Asian studies in Asia, but actually converse, conversely an Asian studies in the West. What are the challenges to a program like Harvard's own East Asian Languages and Civilizations uh, at that point, and how can Asianists contribute around the world contribute to a collective scholarship? Um, finally, I think that an institution like the Harvard Yenching Institute has a big role to play in this sense. Um, it is not necessary for Asia to be united. It's only necessary for Asia-based scholars to converse and communicate with each other actively. And in some ways, uh, the Harvard Yenching Institution is a quintessential hub and spoke. Here we are in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and everybody comes here. But on the other hand, I really think that it's a model for how we can um, move beyond this as well. One of the beauties of Harvard Yenching Institute is that while the location may be Massachusetts, it forges connections between scholars who return to their home countries with greater contacts uh, and knowledge and greater connections to neighbors in Asia. Um, that happened to me when I was a visiting scholar, as well as when I was at uh, a Harvard Yenching Institute uh, alumni conference just a couple of months ago. Professor Gordon was also there um, at Todai, where former uh, Harvard Yenching scholars met to exchange current research. It was delightful um, and really fun to hear the current research of uh, people who, in a wide disciplinary range of Asia-based scholars, and we shared not a language, we shared in common not a language or a region, but actually uh, Harvard Yenching Institute for. So thank you for all that you do here, and thank you for having me here today. Thank you.